blocked out, which is which is hilarious. Anyway, uh, we're here today. Um, you know, you got this big fight coming up with Khabib, so I wanted to, you know, it's a real <laughs> huge honor to get you here. You're you're one of the hottest topics right. in all of not just the country but the world, and uh, we're here today with Conor McGregor. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> it's going great, man. So, I mean, you know, how you been preparing for this fight coming up? I've been eating a lot of potatoes, <laughs> and I ran the other day with some sheep, and uh, and I'm living in Las Vegas eating nut butter. Oh, there we go. <laughs> eating some beardy boy nut butter, huh? Apparently, it's very good for you, allegedly. I'm, I'm here today with my buddy Gavin, and uh, Gavin Murphy has been somebody who has unfortunately uh, <laughs> run into a guy named Michael Tren. And he's been underneath this spell for a long time. And you guys have been training together for how long now? Like six, seven years. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's a long time. Gavin is not jacked or tan, unfortunately. I have a farmer's tan. <laughs> he's, he's pretty well built, but he's on the thinner side. And so when we were lifting together, I was like, oh, you know, let's, you know, Mike has us do these weird exercises. And I'm like, uh, you know, okay, let's see what kind of weights we can throw around here. And then there I am, like. I'm like, okay, well, I can kind of maybe sort of hang with Mike. And then I'm like, okay, nope, that didn't work. And then I was like, well, this guy's a lot smaller than me. Maybe I can, like, try to beat up on him and feel <laughs> good about myself. And that didn't work either. <laughs> that didn't work either. <laughs> you know what? When I met Mike, uh, and it's an interesting story, which I'll get to, how I actually um, got talking to him, which is probably eight years ago. But we started training together because we both were going at 4 a.m., which is our, our optimum time. And, you know, I've, I've been training at that for a I long hope time. hope he's tuning in, by the way. <clears throat> Who? Mike O'Tren. <laughs> I can see if he pops in, but who knows? I'm not yeah. sure if he has a computer. <laughs> uh, but, but, but we know he has a telephone. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we started training together because we're training at the same time, and there was a bigger group of us back then. There was probably eight or ten of us mm. training early in the morning. Um, and over time, people filter off because, you know, coming at 4 a.m. is a big commitment. Tough. You know, you're up at 3 a.m. every day. You got to eat. You got to get in and do it. Obviously, you did it for those two weeks or whatever it was <laughs> yeah. before your competition. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, so he and I just started training, uh, you know, with a couple of other people and we have similar, uh, you know, we have similar drives and obviously Mike has an Irish connection and, you know, I've been known to have been to Ireland before. Um, but his, his uh, style of training was unlike what I was doing. I was more in there looking for the pump and I was doing more hit workouts and just getting in there for an hour and a half and, you know, working out and still feeling good and getting benefits from it. But his system of training was totally different to mine. It mm. was like lower reps, it was heavier weights, and he had a system. I didn't understand the system, but I, I was in it for the journey, so I just right. went along with it to, you know, you know, to try to understand it. Um, obviously, it makes more sense now because we've been training together for a long time. But a lot of people make that assumption because I'm not a big guy, I'm only 185 pounds, um, but with the technique that I've learned from him and the style of training that we do, I'm a lot stronger than people think I am, which is great for me because it helps me, uh, you know, because it motivates me because I'm working out with like bigger guys than you and other guys that come into yeah. the group. Um, so I can hang a little bit more, but also, you know, I think it might spur them on a little bit because they see the, you know, the, you know, the skinny Irish guy who's like putting <laughs> some weights on leg press or whatever. Right. Um, but I get the benefit out of it for sure because I get all of Mike's expertise right. and some of his trend. His uh, <laughs> training is uh, really like uh, un unconventional. You know, his training is, is much, much different and um it's even different than people than people think and it's even different almost than what you see because you only see like a small percentage of it even right. though he records a lot of stuff and he tries to give out a lot of information um i find it fascinating how he's able to avoid injuries and then a lot of the people that he trains with too uh it's no coincidence they're able to avoid injuries as well yeah um he just has certain style and technique and he's got um just these i guess it's more like philosophies got these weird philosophies of like, hey, in this particular squat movement, we're going to push the toes forward, mm -hmm. you know, way, way forward of where, uh, push the knees forward way past the toes. And you would think, oh, I'm going to instantly blow out my knee. Right. But what he's trying to teach people is, hey, with the appropriate amount of weight, you, this can actually be very healthy for your knee. Correct. Um, I, I, I had what is affectionately known as an owie in my knee. And it was just, it was just something came. I didn't injure myself. It was just sore. And we were squatting. This is a couple of months ago. Um, and he could see that I was kind of pushing through it because my form was off. So he said, let's do this. And I just basically pointed my toes out. Obviously, we dropped the weight. But instead of instinctively, people might go, you know what, let me not squat because my knee is sore. Let me do right. like, you know, something else. He's like, no, no, this is why we're going to squat. And we're going to do it this way. And we push through the pain. 
and it actually uh, conversely felt a lot better the next day as opposed to what people would assume is that right. you're going to hurt yourself anymore. But just to speak to your point of that exercise, the one I, you know, you know that you're talking about, where your knees are basically, uh, sorry, where your ankles are underneath you and your knees are going forward because you're going straight down. Yeah, people, that exercise was so hard. It's brutal. And, you know, you can't do a huge amount of weight on it. Obviously, you can build up to it. Um, but again, you know, psychologically, people think, listen, this, this doesn't look right. It doesn't make sense. I'm going to hurt myself. Obviously, if you, know, if you go into a situation thinking that you're going to hurt yourself, <laughs> right. you're probably going to hurt yourself. So, so you go in there thinking, listen, I trust this guy because he's been in the game for 150 years. He's never been <laughs> yeah. injured. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, for real, though. Uh, and I do it. And it, it, you know, it works. So, he I mean, you can't dispute it. Yeah, he says weird shit, too. Like, he says, uh, I got this 1 to 10 uh, ratio theory. Like, you know, when he's dieting, he can do something for a single that he can normally do for 10 when he's, right. like, bulking up. And you're like, and he's like, yep, just did. You know, he'll do something for a single and he'll get up and he'll be super happy about it, even though it's a weaker effort than what he's done in the past. Right. But it's, it's, um, it's unconventional for people to think that way. People just think if you're not getting stronger, you're just automatically getting worse. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, you know, there, you know, outside of the actual lifting part of the workout, there's a lot more that goes on in terms of the psychology, which obviously you can attest to, you know, for someone like me, who's going to go in there and I'm going to leg press, you know, 11 plates. Most people are like, hey, listen, that's just going to break you in half, mm -hmm. but I can do it because I go into that situation telling myself I'm going to leg press 11 plates. Now, right. it's taken me years to get to that situation. I didn't just come in and do it one day. So you have to have the training in order and the practice, but you also have to have the mind right. you got to go in there thinking, this is 11 plates. I've done it before. I'll do it again. It's no big deal. But plus, I like the competition aspect of it too. Does that preparation start the night before for you? Sometimes you start thinking about, hey, what are we training tomorrow, Mike? 100%. And you start thinking about it yeah. right then. Like I, I share that with a lot of people. Uh, that's my pre-workout. Right. You know, like I don't, I don't really get involved in, in a lot of the stimulants and stuff, although they can be useful. I've used them in the past, but I don't have anything against them. But my, for me, my pre-workout is to think about, okay, we're doing that tomorrow and yeah. I'm going to get fired up and I'm going to give it the best damn effort that I can. Well, we always have our workouts planned, right? You know, we never go into the gym in the morning, especially at 4 a.m. and say, listen, what will we do today? Because, you know, you, you know, you have to have a plan. When we all trained together this summer, and that was for like four weeks, and that was a pretty full-on four weeks. Obviously, we had our workouts planned. So every night before I'd go to bed, you know, I'm thinking about the workout because also that part of my brain, there's a little bit of a competitive aspect. So I want to see what I can do because I want to try and hang with the big boys. But also, you just got to be mentally prepared for it, especially with some of the workouts we have are pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, they're very intense. You know, and it's two hours, uh, and there's a lot of sets, there's a lot of reps, there's a lot of weight. And if you're not mentally prepared for that, be because, you know, if you come into the gym at 4 a.m., you know, you don't have any time to, you know I mean, to stand around because we're in there at 4 a.m. for right. a reason. So, you, you know, you got to come in ready to go. If you come strolling in at 4.15 and you didn't have a meal... You're not going to, you're not going to, you're just going to, you're going to weed yourself out. Be you know, you're going to do that for three sessions and then you're just probably not going to show up. Well, that happens a lot in our group because it takes a huge commitment to say, I'm going to get up at 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm going to cook breakfast and have breakfast. And I'm going to be in the gym at 4 a.m. I'm going to be there till 6 or 6.15. And then I got a whole day ahead of me. Do you know what I mean? It's not like I'm going back to bed afterwards. Yeah. I mean, I'm up then for the day. So for someone like me, it's, um, you know, I thrive on that though. Because I like that aspect yeah. of it. Um, some people, you know, they'll come for a while because it's cool and they get their IG videos and they've worked out <laughs> with Mike, you know, and the Irish guys in the corner, whoever he is. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, you, you know, then they're gone because, you know, the alarm goes off, you know, I'll go tomorrow. Right. Then you're done. You're not coming back tomorrow. <clears throat> yeah, it's almost, you know, a lot of people don't know this about Michael Hearn. There's some people online that love him. There's some people online that hate him. <clears throat> Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of misconceptions about him out there. But one thing that people should understand and know is that he, uh, as you get to know him, he's a very kind person. He's a very loving person. And he's actually a mentor to a lot of people, especially yeah. it's not really just inside the gym. I mean, that's where we know him and that's where we do learn stuff from him. But he's, uh, I mean, when you're training at 4 a.m., it does some shit to your mind. And when you're training that hard, that early, what are some things that you picked up from him that you've been able to carry on into uh, business and into life? I mean, the number one thing for us to, you know, in, in, you know, that I've picked up <coughs> is you have to be committed to whatever you're doing. So if I say, and this is, this is just something for me, the way I grew up, you know, when I say that I'm turning up, I'm turning up, mm. you know, I'm never telling you I'm coming and I'm just not coming. And if I'm late, then I'm, 
then it's just, you know, you know, it's a non-starter for right. me. So um, for me, it's a commitment level, which means that I can get in there. I can, um, I'm showing up to the workout. So I'm not just coming in there just to call it in. Um, but for me, it's also about starting my day right mentally, because when I'm finished my workout, I'm high in endorphins, which means I'm coming home. And sometimes my wife is, how much fucking coffee have you had? I actually <laughs> haven't had any coffee. She says, because it's 6am, I'm just getting up and you're talking a mile a minute. So you got to, you know, you got to slow down a small bit. So for me, it just sets the tone for my whole day. Right. You know, so I'm productive. I bring my son to school and then I'm off working on my business or I'm off just working, working, just hustling. Um, but for me, it just sets the tone and that's really, really important. I'm a structured guy. I like structure. I need structure. And this fits right in my wheelhouse. One thing I like that he does yeah. that I picked up, and um, I, I've, I've sort of done this over the years, but not quite to the degree that he does it. Um, I like how he doesn't have much facial expressions during the lifts. Now, like when I used to compete and stuff, I always kind of felt like, hey, I trained for it. It's no surprise I made the lift, so I wouldn't really like celebrate it and that, that kind of thing. Right. But you can see here he's pressing four plates. And it is strenuous. You can see like he's got a vein popping in his forehead, you know? It's still 400 pounds, whatever way you look at it. Right. Right? It's a lot of weight. But the rest of his body is just like, okay, we're pressing it. And it's really interesting how, and, and I've seen you do it as well, and, and some of the other people that he's worked with for a long time, where most people, when they go to press a weight or they go to do a certain movement, the body starts to squirm. Like one shoulder will come up or a butt cheek will come up over here or, or whatever, and you squirm. As if you're like a um, bug being fried by a magnifying glass. Not that I ever did that as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, you, you squirm around like you're, you're right. super uncomfortable, right? And, and I, I don't see you guys doing that. How, like, is, there, is that a certain thing that he teaches or what do you think is uh, yeah. responsible for something? This around? is, so, we, you know, when I started training with Mike first, the first thing that. Like, he, look at his body in this, yeah. in this instance, we're watching him do some incline presses. His body's either just going to stop lifting it. Yeah. Uh, or. Or he'll or make it, but he'll still have flawless form and technique. One of the things that, um, one of the, um, I don't want to say rules, one of the precedents that was set was firstly no shorts. Mike's opposed to wearing shorts in the gym and I was all about <laughs> shorts. Um, and that's not so much as, you know, I mean, don't be wearing shorts, but it's about, you, you know, for him, he's always covered up because mm -hmm. he's working on his, you know, on right. his physique, his masterpiece, whatever. So that was sort of drilled into me. Um, but to speak to your point about the moving around, he's like, you know what? You don't need to be making noise or squirming. Get under the weight. You see what you're doing in your head, which again, equates to what you're doing in life, right? You have a vision of what you're doing. I'm getting under it. I'm going to push the weight and you just do it. Right. But he's, you know, he's, he's not for, you know, making noise and grunting and groaning and squirming around the place because the more squirming you're doing, the more energy you're exerting and then you're wasting energy. Right. So it's a breath in and you lower the weight and you push it back up and it's as simple as that. It's a simple technique, um, but it's, you know, it's a technique that, you know, that he's always used and he's been doing this for, you know, for 30 years, 35 yeah. years. And, um, you know, there's a lot to be said for it. You know, it's not for everybody. Some guys are in there and they like to throw the weights around and make noise, but that's what gets them going. It's up to you. Right. But for our, you know I mean? For our group or our team, it's more about, you know, being almost like silent assassins. Yeah. Get in there. And get under it and just get it done and then leave the gym and nobody knows if you've actually even been there. <laughs> right. You know, and I, I love the philosophy and it, but I was kind of taken back by, I mean, I've known Mike forever, but I never really trained with him at, uh, to that degree. Right. Um, years ago when he and I trained together, it was like, we'd get together here and there for some squat sessions and it wasn't really like an all out blitz of like a leg day. It would just be some sets of squats and stuff. It was nothing like he, it was nothing like he trains, uh, he trains today, but I really love the, uh, the mentality and the philosophy and some of the, some of the principles, but you wouldn't think that of him because when we're training with him, he spends probably 90% of the time in between the lifts, looking at himself in the mirror. Uh, at least 90%. <laughs> and the guy's not, he, he's, he's, he's not afraid to admit that he loves attention. So you would, you would kind of assume, okay, this guy that likes attention, he's going to yell and scream and make a big scene every right. time he does a lift. And that's yeah. not, he doesn't make any noise really at all. Other than like some breathing, right? Yeah. No, no, there's no disputing the fact that the mirror is his friend. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and, and, you know, IG stories, but when he's in the lift, when he's in the gym and, and he's in his exercise, uh, more than likely his eyes are closed yeah, and he's just in it. He's coming in the gym and he's, he's coming at home. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, but it's very much uh, a mindset. Um, and 
you know, to you know, to be fair, he loves to kind of talk you through and to kind of guide you in certain little tweaks. Maybe you know, maybe put your hands this way. Maybe do this. Right. Um, but it's a very simple form. I mean, I mean, you breathe in, you push the weight, you breathe out. It's as simple as that. Right. There's and no, you know, secrets to it. He's got uh, just he's just compiled a lot of consistency over the years. And you know, when I think back to when I first met him, and I think about the shape and the strength that. Uh, my brother was in, or I think about the shape and strength that I was in, or I think about the shape and condition and strength that he was in when we all first met, none of us stopped lifting. Right. You know, my brother, my brother had some, uh, issues with, uh, some drugs and some alcohol and stuff, but even, even then he really didn't, he, he, he fell off, you know, life-wise he was, he was really struggling and things were hard for him, but he was still lifting. Right. And if you look now, like when we start, when we were back, uh, in Venice, and we're training with Mike. Everyone's in good shape. Everyone's pretty healthy. Everyone's pretty damn strong. Right. And it's, uh, that's, that's what this is all about. It's about trying to find something that you love to do and repeat doing it over and over again. And you got to figure out a way to, to develop some sort of consistency with it. Well, I mean, consistency is key for anything that we're talking about. This, for me and for you and probably for Mike, is key to the, you know, um, is something that that would translate into every aspect of your life. Right. You know, you got to be consistent with everything. Do you got to be, you know, you, you, you know, consistent in your marriage, with your kids, with your diet, with your work ethic, with your friends. Everything's got to have consistency because that's what makes the river run. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, if there's bumps in it, which obviously there will be, but then the key is to recognize it and to change it again and then to go back to where you were or to get back on track. You know, we all have our you know, our vices and things that are going to throw us off track. Um, you know, a curveball, like you're going to the gym, so, you know, your kid gets sick and you can't make it. Right. It is what it is. Tomorrow's a new day. We start again tomorrow. Right. Do you know what I mean? But you got to be consistent in every single thing you do. And, you know, for us, it starts with the gym. My mom recently has lost uh, 60 pounds. And kind of during this uh, course of her doing this diet, you know, every once in a while, like every other week or so, she'd be like, ah, oh, you know, I messed up last night and I ate this or whatever. I'm like, hey, it doesn't matter. Because it's about consistency. Yeah. I was like, let's not let's not talk about the one slip up that you had in two weeks. Let's talk about how the last fourteen days you kick some ass, and how the next fourteen days you're gonna kick some ass, and maybe that cycle will repeat. But you have a lot of consistency going on, and you're heading in the direction that you want to head in. I think also um, when people have a bump in the road in whatever they're doing, they focus so much energy on it and they mm. beat themselves up on it. I had, you know, I, I, I ate a bad meal or I had a bad meeting. They'll focus so much energy on that yeah. that it'll throw them off getting back on track and they won't recognize or, you know, they won't give themselves credit for all the good that they've done. Right. You, you know, in your mom's case, she had the 14 days, she had a bad meal. She's focused on the bad meal thinking that those 14 days are now valueless right. where in actual fact, it probably did her, you know, did her psyche, mm -hmm. you know, the power to good because she got her craving out of the way and, and yep. now she gets back on the wagon and she'll come back stronger and she'll be able to recognize the next time she has a craving, maybe she can have something else or maybe she you know, gives you a call so, you know, and she says, listen, I want to have this food. Listen, have it, it's no big deal right. because you're consistent. You're going to get back on track and come back stronger the next time. So that just equates to anything you do. I think sometimes too, it's okay to let that bump carry you off the road a little bit as long as you're not completely off the rails. Right. Um, Make sense of it. Like, what are you doing? Right. Like, are, are, did you take your kid to a baseball game and, uh, you know, he has a hot dog and you're whipping out, uh, you know, a Tupperware with chicken breasts and no, you, you go to the baseball game, you eat what he eats and you, you have, you have some dude time together Exactly. and you hang out and you enjoy, you enjoy the game. And maybe because of that, maybe the, because of that, uh, you do something the next day that's a little bit off, but just, it's okay. It's going to be fine. It's, it, this is not not done in a day. It's not done in a week. It's not done in a month. It's not done in a year. I mean, as long as you kind of get back to your principles right. and you got your normal game plan going on, everything's going to be totally fine. You don't need to freak out. But also, I think that comes with age and maybe a little bit more experience. I know that, you know, back in my 20s or maybe early 30s when when I was trying to get into, you know, you know more into the fitness and, 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 and the diet and such, um, when I would have an off day, like that, it would throw me off so much that I would beat myself up so much mm. about it. But now I actually allow myself to have it yeah. and I don't freak out about it because at the end of the day, it's not a big deal. Do you know what I mean? Again, consistency, but being able to recognize that, you know what, I bump in the road, I enjoyed it. You know, you right. know, I went to my kid's baseball game and ate a hot dog. Right. You know, I mean, you're creating memories and you're giving your kid memories, you know, of that situation. 
right. then tomorrow you get back on the horse and you start going again. Do you know what I mean? But but it's important to recognize those things, but to be able to live in the moment and enjoy them too, and not be sitting there at the baseball game eating a hot dog <laughs> and just guilting yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You know, be should I be enjoy- eating this? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then saying, "Oh man, I should have brought my tuna and rice, but I didn't." Listen, just enjoy it, and then just you know we start again tomorrow. It's a tough thing to figure out, you know, because it has to be forced. You know, if you want to be great in this life, I, I, I'm a big believer, like it has to be forced. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, great things can come to you if you are consistent and things like that, but sure. it still has to be forced. Uh, the hard thing is, is to know when to not force it. Right. So in your case, like you like to wake up early, you're a chef, uh, you have a lot of responsibility. You got a six year old son, a lot of things going on. And, uh, and now you're moving, coming up and stuff like that. You got a lot of shit going on. So how do you determine, I mean, you've texted me before and said, Hey man, I just, it's not going to work. And I know, I know I can, I can almost feel it through the text message that you're pissed that you can't make it the next day, but it would be like nine 30 or 10 o'clock at night. And right. it's like, well, that makes sense. Look at, you know, look how late it is. Obviously he's not going to be able to, you know, get the sleep in that's necessary. So how do you know when to not force it? I'm, I'm learning, um, to trust myself. And to listen to myself, there was, I, I can remember it was a few years ago, maybe about four years ago, and I have a catering business. So I was catering an event. It was Halloween. It was all day I was working. I think I worked like 14 hours. Uh, and it rained and it was a whole thing. I got to bed at 2.30 a.m. And I woke up at 4.30 to go to the gym. <laughs> and I was like, if I don't wake up at 4.30, I'm a fucking loser. <laughs> That's how my head was working, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I would just, this is the way it has it's to be. It's actually true. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I would beat myself. So yeah. I pulled myself out of bed after two hours of sleep. I had worked 14 hours a day before yeah. to go to the gym for two hours on the, on the off chance that I would feel better, which I did feel better. But then I got home and I was just exhausted all day. Whereas clearly I needed to sleep, mm. right? You know, it, it's, it, it, it's now a case of me understanding more about about myself and what my body needs and trusting that and knowing how important sleep is and not beating myself up about it. I would just self-loathe so much that I would just, well, I have to go if I don't go to the gym. Like, you know, I, I, I don't do that anymore. I mean, sometimes it still creeps in sometimes. Mm. You know, if I get to bed after like 11 p.m. for me to get up at 3 a.m., because I know I've got a full day, that just doesn't make sense. I'm not a right. kid anymore, right? I'm 48, so I mean, I need some sleep. Um, but I understand more about it but I still went through a lot of period of time where I would beat myself up if I didn't go. I'd so it's mainly from experience. You had, you, you tried it you, and you're like, that shit don't work. It doesn't I, I need, work. I need to fig, I need to just not go to the gym for yeah. that day. And then, uh, you, you got the consistency, which you'll, you'll catch back up to the lifting of some other time. Of course. And you know, I'll come back stronger the next time. Right. You know, once, you know, so I mean, fighting with, for, you know, fighting with the, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, demons in your head sometimes are, is actually more exhausting. Then the physical exhaustion of like going right. to the gym, you know, um, you know, we exert so much energy, um, giving all the negative thoughts, a lot right. of energy, whereas, you know, we shouldn't be you know, paying any attention to it. Obviously, I mean, you can use it as a driving force and everything. But in my case, I'm just it, j- just years of learning myself and trusting my own instinct. Were you born in the United States? I was not. You can tell. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the lead in. So, you know, there's a lot of people, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, are born in this country. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not even, I don't even consider myself to be like overly patriotic or anything like that. But I think that there's a, you know, this is considered the land of opportunity. Right. You know, there's a lot of great opportunities out there. Sure. And you got a lot of people that are squandering it away. And then you have a lot of people that come over that are immigrants and they take advantage of this being the land of opportunity. Right. And they buckle down, they work hard. Maybe it's because they, uh, of, uh, what they saw mom and dad do as a kid to, to get here, to get to this country, to provide for their children, to, to try to figure out, you know, how, how do I get my kids a little bit better life than, than what I have? Uh-huh. Not like Ireland's a third world country or anything, but you kind of get the picture. Um, was that kind of your story? Like, what, what's your story coming from Ireland? Did you get yourself here? Did your parents come here? So I was born and raised in Ireland, lived there for 30 years. Um, I gave myself until I was 30 to either stay and settle down at home or leave because I loved coming to, I um, my first summer was in Martha's Vineyard so before I got into cooking at all I did marketing business in college for four years in my third year of college when I was 21 I went to Martha's Vineyard and worked washing dishes in a restaurant for, mm. for the summer and loved it I'd never worked in the kitchen of a restaurant before I'd, I'd worked in bars and restaurants and hotels 
as soon as I got into that kitchen, I knew that's what I was going to do. So I went back and finished my my uh, marketing. You like the energy of it. I like the energy. I like the uh, the um, the camaraderie. I like the way the chef was the big dog in the kitchen. I just like the whole energy mm. and the f you know you, you know it's like the engine of the ship. Yeah. So um, went to a cooking school back in Ireland, and when I was 24, and then just worked restaurants, hotels, lived in London for a period of time, um, ran a restaurant back in Ireland, and then when I turned 30. Um, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm either going to go or I'm going to stay. And I talked to my parents and I said, I'm going to go to California. So my old man lent me a couple of grand and I bought a ticket and came to Los Angeles. I had a friend of mine from home. His brother lives in L.A. I uh, didn't really know him that well. Slept on his couch for three months. Didn't know anybody, didn't have any jobs, didn't have anything. And from there, I then just started um, getting some jobs, you know, cooking. And my first uh, break, if you will, you know, by myself, I was working for a lady who was a caterer and she got a call by a PR company that uh, this uh, company called EAS, they do the Myoplex drinks and stuff. They yeah. wanted to get a chef to cook for Cindy Crawford because they wanted mm -hmm. to bring her into this body for life program that they had. And they wanted someone to sort of entice her in with the food and because they yeah. wanted her to be a spokesperson. We've had Bill Phillips on the podcast okay. before, yeah. Bill. The owner of EAS, yeah. So I did this program. So I cooked this food for her. And they hired me it was based on the, the, the breakdown of carbs, proteins, fats. So I did all her meals for about four months, um, you know, based on this Body for Life program. How long ago was that? That was in 2004, okay. five. Was that, kind of, was that weird? Like, were you like Cindy totally, Crawford? Like, yeah. Holy shit. I felt totally out of my, you know. <laughs> it, 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 You're like, it, wait, what? It was weird what the first time I met her. Yeah, what are you calling me about? <laughs> uh, Cindy who? Yeah, yeah, it must be a different Cindy Crawford, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, but so I was like, yeah, I guess. I mean, it seems it seems odd they're hiring me to do it, but I'm in. So, but but that's kind of my personality. I mean, if I have an opportunity, I'm going after it. Looking back, do you feel you were prepared for that moment? Like, did did you have enough under your belt to be able to kind of handle that? I had enough to figure it out. I figured out as as I was had going. enough determination to make it to make it work. Force correct, it because work. I studied it. Yeah. So you know, it wasn't different. You know, a difficult philosophy. Um, a lot of people, I think, would have been overwhelmed by the fact that it was Cindy Crawford and it mm. was her family I was going in their homes. Because understand, me being a chef and I'm cooking for people in their homes, I'm, I'm in their private space. Right. So I become part of their family unit, even just for a period of time. So, you know, I learned very quickly to respect that. There's mm. a boundary. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not their buddy, you, you know, you, you, you know. Gav's not in there hanging out for chat over the kitchen counter. I mean, they're to cook for them. So you don't Uber the situation. Like the Uber driver always gets involved in your conversations. Yeah, you ever no, that's that? the worst. You're like, we leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're, my wife and I are having a conversation. You're like, oh yeah, I hate when that happens. You're like, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> You're like, what? What's the deal with the DMV, huh, guys? <laughs> <laughs> I got the same problem. And they start unloading on you. You're yeah. like, what the hell? And then, and then he gives you a fee for the therapy. Yeah. 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 Here's 20 bucks. So anyway, I mean, so I, I never got really um, caught up in the whole thing. As cool as it was, for me, it was an opportunity and it was a job. Firstly, I mean, I love food. I love fitness. So for me, this was a great opportunity mm. to marry the two things that I loved. But I was working for a big company, so I saw it as an opportunity. If I can nail this, this could turn into something else, which luckily for me, it did. I started doing some, um, some trade shows for them and started doing some work on their website with recipes and you know, contributed to one of their cookbooks and things. Mm. So that did open some doors for me. And then I met some contacts through her and worked for some of her friends. So this was, a, you know, a stepping stone. And I was able, I think, to see that this is an opportunity for me. You know, you know, someone just handed me something on a plate. I'm going to roll with it. Yeah. So I figured it out as I went, <clears throat> which is what I do with most things. And then, uh, you know, kind of having the blessing from your dad and him, you know, get him uh, supporting it, <clears throat> especially yeah. financially and stuff. Did, was that a big driving factor once you got here? Like, I, like, I kind of need to figure this out. I don't want to let anybody down. The, the, the work ethic that I learned from my old man was basically just to, just to roll up your sleeves and get it done. And that's mm. kind of like my mentality. It's a very Irish thing as well because the men were the... Were he the, was a potato farmer, right? Obviously. <laughs> and a sheep herder. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you know, you rolled up your sleeves and you just did it because, because that's the way it was. The, you, you know, the man of the house was the provider. Now, I grew up in a great house. I mean, you know, we had family dinners every night. It was a very classic situation, you know. So Shitload of kids? Four. Two four, and two. Yeah. yeah. Mike's got, what, 10, 9? 12. I think he knows two Twelve. of them. <laughs> 12, yeah. Yeah, that Irish Catholic. Yeah, or something like that. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that was my mentality. I mean, I was coming over here, um, so I wasn't going to mess it up. I wasn't coming over here to not, you know what I mean, you know, to not succeed. It just mm. wasn't happening. 
So, you know, and everything I take on, I go in there thinking there's someone trying to take this from me in my job. So I better crush it or I better go after it and, and you, you know, at least give it my best effort. And that's sort of my mentality has always been. Mm. I mean, I'm just, you know, you know, blue collar. So I just, I just do it. From, from that time period, uh, were you able to just kind of parlay that into your own business or did you have to work in other restaurants and work for other people for a while? I worked, I was able to parlay that opportunity into doing some catering. And, if, you know, I would do a barbecue for 20 or 30 people because I'd worked for so many other people. So other catering companies would bring me in to help run the kitchen for, you know, mm. you, you know, if they were doing an event for five, 600 people, I wasn't able to figure that out, but I could certainly manage the kitchen and manage the people working in the kitchen and get the right. food done for them. So I learned a lot about the management side of it, which I've always been good at because I've been good at delegating and figuring out how to, how to, how to get production done. So I was able to use those skills so that when people started calling me, you know, can you do an event for me? Um, which might just be a, you know, a dinner or a barbecue, whatever. Then I was able to, um, parlay that into I can organize the staff I can get security mm. I can organize rentals because I can make money off of all of that as opposed right. to me just going there doing the food so I was able to offer it a full service which is what I do for my clients now I don't do the big 500 people parties right. but I do consistently you know 50, 100, 200 people right. but I can organize all of it and then I have you know and then I'm in charge of it so obviously if something messes up it's on me but, but I'm okay with that because if it doesn't mess up, which, t you know, touch wood, it hasn't, right. then it's on me too. So I get that. So it's a risk reward factor. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to operate that way because it, it just, it, you know, I, 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 I like to have a vested interest in it. Right. So I like having the buck stop at me because then I'm going to give it 100% and just make sure it happens. Yeah, you're in control of the situation. You know, a lot of people, when they think about catering, they kind of just think about the food. Correct. But then they're not thinking about like, the cleanup. All of it. I mean, the cleanup is like a really huge part of it because if somebody comes and they were to cater something at your home, um, yeah, it'd be great to enjoy some really good food. That would be awesome. But yeah. how much better would it be if everything was cleaned up afterwards well, too? Well, if the house is cleaner yeah. you know, afterwards than before, which invariably it usually is. Right. Because for some reason, people have this habit of leaving dishes all <laughs> over the sink before you even get there. So you got to wash their dishes <laughs> and then start your work. It's, you know, you know, it's funny how that works. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's a full service because that's what... Listen, people are bringing you into their homes, as I said. Mm. So it's a very intimate, it's a very personal, it's a very private environment. That must be something you have to explain to all your employees, all the people that work with I, you, right? I, I, I did a party once um, for a very good client of mine who is very well known in the movie industry. And it was in a house uh, north of L.A. And I got home the next, you know, and we did the party. I got home the next day and my wife was on Facebook and said, so-and-so just tagged where he was yesterday and mentioned my client's name. Mm. I had to call him. I said, get that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What no. are you thinking? Yeah. This is someone's private house and mm. you put down on Facebook where you were just to what? To get some likes or get some shares? <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because that's all it was for. Listen, it's cool and all. I get it. Um, but you have to understand the privacy factor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in someone's house. If I'm telling you that I work for so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, then nobody's going to hire me because they think, well, he's going to tell somebody else that he worked for me. Because, you know... Uh, you know, it's a very intimate uh, and, you know, they're paying money for me just to do my job and keep my mouth shut. Right. And that's what I do. Well, they don't want any extra hassle. I mean, they already have so many things going on all the time. I mean, they don't want... They want to trust you. And the if they burden. trust you, then they're more likely to hire me and to recommend, you know, and then recommend me to other people. Yeah. And touch wood, I've been lucky enough that way to have a core group of clients who I all work for, who all know each other because they all know that I'll come in, I'll do a stellar job and I'll take care of it and we'll be out and nobody knows anything. And that's the way it operates. You know, yeah, I got some friends that train some people that are pretty high up and it's kind of the same thing. You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, how are you able to train those people? Like, how, how did it work? He's like, well, I just always keep my mouth shut. I, you know, you have to, it, they're the ones that share that he trains them and they share it amongst each other. Right. He's like, but I'm not out, you know, saying, Hey, like I did this with this guy or here's a selfie of me and so-and-so. Oh, <laughs> He's like, I'm not doing all that shit. He's like, if they want to take one, then I'm pumped to of take course. one. But, but you can never ask. He's him. like, I'm not, yeah. He's like, I'm not asking them, them for shit. Yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. That you makes know, I, sense. I asked a client for a reference once cause I wanted to use it for, um, on, on my website that I launched this years ago. And I went back and forth about it for weeks and weeks mm. and weeks. And eventually I just said, you know what, yeah, because I had a good relationship with them. So I talked to them and they were like, yeah, of course. So I'd built it up so much in my mind because I respected their privacy mm -hmm. so much, but they were like, yeah, you know, and they wrote me this whole letter on, on, you know, on, on a formal letterhead, everything. I mean, it was right. amazing. But for me to ask them was a huge ask for me, but I would never ask someone for a photo and stuff. I mean, 
That's a big part of being an entrepreneur is like, uh, unfortunately you do have to be pushy sometimes. Like yeah, you, some, there, yeah. there's these opportunities where you're like, ah, eh, like I don't want to do this, but I kind of need to. Yeah. And you're like, shit, like I got to throw slingshots on people. I got to throw, you know, knee sleeves and wrist wraps on people. And, and maybe not everyone's always going to love it, but I, ha but I have to be willing to, to, to do it. Like if I, even like, uh, even with Joe Rogan, right. You know, it's like, I slapped a slingshot on him. Like, I don't care who it is. I'm going to throw a slingshot on him now. Again, like I said, they might not love it. Joe Rogan's like, ah, dude, you know, I, I tweaked my shoulder. I'm not sure. And now you had some shoulder issues and, and you uh, ended up using the product a lot. But, yep. you know, not everyone is going to love that style, but it's like, I don't know any other way. Sometimes I got to just push Sometimes forward. Sometimes you just got to go ballsy and, yeah. you know, just do it, you know, and listen, if you get, you know, if you get fight back or, you know, or they don't like it, or, you know, whatever, listen, it is what it is, but you got to put yourself out there. Right. You know, the fear of rejection is a killer for a lot of people. Mm because they've built it up so much, the fear of what if they don't like it? What if they look bad at me? What if, what if, what if? But what if they love it? Yeah. And then it propels you to a new level. You know, you got to take the chance, man. Isn't it amazing the things you make up that, peop that <laughs> people are going to say to you? Yeah. Like, oh, I can't approach them with that. And they haven't said anything. <laughs> yeah. You saying it to you about them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they might be thinking, God, you know, I wish you'd asked me to taste this product or yeah. to try on the slingshot because I'd love to try mm -hmm. it but you built it up so much in your own head that they're going to hate it. Oh my God, I'm the worst ever. How can I do this to them? And I'm like, Dude, can you slow down? I'm, you know, your own demons will just like <laughs> crucify you. They'll tear you apart. Yeah, you yeah, imagine sure. the whole conversation. They're going to say this, so I got to say that. And then oh, they're probably oh, yeah. going to question that. So I got to be ready for this and that. And none of it happens. And then yeah. they just say, yeah, okay. And You're yeah. ready for this giant imaginary conversation yeah. that never happened. <laughs> yeah. And it will probably never actually happen. Yeah, it's I rare to confront anyone. Right? I, know, I saw Mark throw a slingshot on Chuck Liddell in Chuck Liddell's house as he's like, I got to go to a meeting. He's like, hey, wait, check this out. And he was, you know, he was down for it and he, he did a couple push-ups and it was, it was awesome. Sometimes you just got to take that chance. Oh, man. I was yeah. terrified too. I'm Chuck like, Liddell. he's going to roundhouse yeah. me upside the head. And then put on a suit and go to a meeting and you'll be down there bleeding and crying <laughs> in the corner. Yeah, some dudes in my house. Yeah. So you mentioned you're moving coming up. We are moving uh, a little relocation um, to Vegas. Like in Vegas, a, baby. In a week, uh, in actually Vegas, Vegas, or where you, or you know, a Vegas, Well, just outside the strip. I mean, I'm not moving mm -hmm. to the Sahara just yet. Yeah. Penthouse. Mm -hmm. No, out out to a suburb of Vegas. Um, we had an opportunity to relocate. I've been doing a lot of um, kind of work on myself the past few months. Mindset work, a little transitional. You probably work. don't normally have have time for that. No, but I made time for this because I felt like I you needed something. You and I something. talked a bunch about yeah. that when I was down yeah. there. Did that have anything to do with it? It did because oh, I was. Nice. Because I I'll was. Take credit for that. Mm -hmm. Bam. <laughs> <It's> a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> but I've been thinking, you know, the past few months, I mean, I've been, uh, I feel like I've just been kind of, um, you know, on my journey, which has been great and all, but I felt like I needed to do a little bit of work on myself. You know, my, my, my uh, dad passed, you know, last April. Oh man, sorry and to hear that. I didn't thank you. And I didn't. You know, in true Irish style, I just buried it right. and did nothing with it for like, I came back, he passed in April, I came back and worked like nine weeks every mm -hmm. day, every single day, didn't, didn't even, in fact, I hardly even told anybody. Right. Um, and that was just, you know, it was, you know, it was a defense mechanism it was also j just didn't know how to handle the feelings, didn't think I could talk about being sad or whatever, do you know what I mean? So I didn't. Um, and I was talking to my buddy, um, Steve Weatherford, he played for the Giants, he's a good yeah. friend of mine. So I had talked to him after my dad passed uh, and he was like, listen, you know, I'm taking this course. It's really, you know, it, it might be good for you to help you sort of, you know, come over this, but it's also, you know, a mindset, it's a leadership, it's a business, but they deal with some other things first just to kind of clear the pipes, if you will. And I was like, you know, I'm not really a... Uh, yeah, Sounds weird, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, kind of, but not really. I mean, do I want to spend some money on this and commit to it? Or can I just read a Tony Robbins book and call it a day? <laughs> uh, so anyway, I just, he said, listen, I think this would be good for you. So I said, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. So I did it. So I'm, I'm almost finished it now. Uh, and boy, that opens some. Is it, it's something you physically go to. It's like a class. It's a class. It's like three phases. The first phase, it's called hardcore leadership. It's down in San Diego. The first phase is like, um, three, uh, three days. So three, like 12 hour days. Then went home for like a week and a half and came back and did four mm. solid 12 and a half hour days. And you're just being bomb, you know, bombarded, you know, they push you places that you don't want to go in you know, your head. Like childhood stuff it's and all probably sorts. exhausting i was absolutely and then you come back for two days like the two days later which was last week but other just, people are there doing it like as well right other people in the room yeah so you have opportunities to talk but you're talking kind of in a controlled environment where you right. can 
be vulnerable and be authentic and talk yeah, and about it's, uh, strangers, I guess. Strangers, yeah, yeah, right, totally. So. so I was able to just unload about the fact that I lost my dad, and I spent basically three days crying in front of strangers, but I felt better. Right. But then it gives well, me... Well, everybody else there is like, yeah, I lost somebody too, of right? Of course. And, and then, then they relate like, to the oh, story. Okay. Yeah. And then you start talking about other things that you might have, unco- you know, might have in common. Um, but then it started giving me some clarity. So I knew mm-hmm. I needed to do some work on myself. I wasn't going to do it by myself. So I needed, I needed to be pushed. And then this opportunity um, to, to, to move from um, LA and just, just start fresh. So we're seeing it as a whole transition for the family. Right. So we're, uh, you know, going to go to Vegas next week. Um, house hunting as we speak just to rent something even to rent something is difficult over there uh, uh, you, you and... mentioned that um, you're almost 50 or 48 years old yeah and uh, did some of this like go into this course like did some of it seem weird like like what like I've been around the block man like I, I don't need this thing I felt like that everybody else was abnormal and I was completely sane and I should not be here because these fuckers are just losers and I'm perfect <laughs> until they started talking to me and I realized I am just fucked. Yeah, we're all broken. <laughs> yeah, but broken. I mean, th- you know, there was stuff that I was talking about. Now, you, you, know, you, you know, it wasn't anything drastic, but just stuff I hadn't told about. It could be something stupid. You didn't get it picked for the baseball team when you were like eight and somebody anything. said something weird and it threw you off and you remembered it forever. For because it puts a blockage in there and you got to yeah. go back and find out what that blockage to get rid of it so you can open up your mind, you know what I mean? And start thinking, oh, you know what? I can do bigger things that I'm doing right now. Mm. And that's where I'm at right now is, you know, as much as I have big dreams and I have the vision of what I'm trying to do with myself and with, you know, you know, with my brand and my company, um, you know, there were still blockages in the roads that After, I got. After, uh, you know, going through, uh, you know, several days of this and kind of getting over the hump of it being awkward, uh, as it started like healing and as you started kind of growing from it a little bit, were you almost a little reluctant to share it? Cause you're like, I don't know if I want to tell everybody about this because this is like a secret weapon. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I haven't really discussed it okay. up until like now, uh, but nobody's watching, right? So it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. It's just Hopefully the three of us. No, no followers um, here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm talking about it more uh, with people who I think will be able to receive it. It's not like it's, uh, it's like, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, special formula. It's just about being able to communicate yeah. and being able to listen and more importantly, being able to hear. Like I took this course Part of the catalyst was that my wife, Christy, um, you know, was telling me that she just wants to be heard. You know, I was, you know, we would have conversations, but I'd be thinking of so many different things in my head, things I got to do that I'm not listening to her at That's all. That's very typical. You know, I, I think a lot of, a lot of guys, you know, um, just take on this. It, it's a thing we make up ourselves like that. We have to go and we have to do all this work all the time. Right. And it's like. No, like everything's fine. And by you working a couple extra hours, it's not going to really change much of anything. Right. But you just think like, no, it's, it's for my son. It's for my wife. And it's not really. It's not it, for anybody. It's, it's for you. It's, it's, it's for selfish. you. And, and you got yourself like caught up in like the wrong, your time is invested in the wrong spot. And, well, that, and that's what can happen sometimes. Well, also we make ourselves, and this is what I was doing, that I'm so important and I'm so busy and I have, oh, listen, I can't deal with this right now. Because I have 10 other things I need to do that are fucking unbelievably, that need to be done now, which is like none of these things are happening. And these are for famous people and stuff too. I don't have time for this shit. I'm so busy. You know what? <laughs> Call my assistant who I'm going to hire next week and we'll deal with it. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we build up our own story in our head that we just have all these things going on, whereas you really don't. If you don't make time for this conversation mm-hmm. right now, none of this other shit matters at all. Do you know right. what I mean? So the conversations I was having with Christy, my wife, and, you know, and she was like, You're, I'm, I mean, I just want a voice. I want to be heard, right? There's a conversation and I'm not listening because I'm thinking of doing something else. But you got to be present in what we're talking about right now. Right. So the person understands that you're really paying attention and this is important enough for, for me to listen to what you have to say. And, and then you move on to the next thing. Do you know what I mean? But you'll get so much more out of being authentic and being true to who you want to be and who you want to talk to and the, and the message you want to give and also receive from the other person that your life's going to be so much better, right? So I'm learning all this stuff and I'm 48, right? So it's not like I have like two years of shit. I got 48 years of crap that I'm trying to figure out in my right. head. Do you know what I mean? But also part of this is I wanted to push myself and see if I would complete it, which I would never go into anything and not complete it. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to see like, right, I'm 48. You know, can I really kind of... um improve myself if you will and maybe you know take on some other points of view and not think that I'm always right which I do 
you know, which, you know, a lot of us, because, you know, once we get older, we think, well, <laughs> you know, I know everything I know best, but you really don't. Now, in certain situations you do, but I wanted to see if I would be open enough to take on criticism and not go into my defense mechanism, which is, well, I might be this, but you're this. Do you know what I mean? That sort of stuff. <laughs> right. um, so, so I really wanted to test myself. It's kind of similar to what we do in the gym. I want to push mm-hmm. myself. So I just made a, you know, a nice little link back. But, you know, when we're you know, deadlifting or doing some squats or whatever, I want to see if I can do it. If I don't do it, I don't do it. But I certainly want to get under it and see if I can lift it. So I want to push myself. This way I wanted to push myself mentally mm. to see if I could, um, you know, see if I could hang. Do you know what I mean? It, it, you know, it's an interesting topic because I think when you think about celebrities or you think about, um, you know, these uh, rock stars or professional wrestlers, you know, some of my friends who are professional wrestlers, they had a hard time uh, coming home from, you know, they're, they're, they live in California and they're in New Jersey. Right. And, and then they're in New York and they're in Vegas and then they're in Florida and they're, they're all, all these different spots. And then they come back home and, you know, here they were, they were these big stars to these people, right? They have all these fans, they get all this like credibility. Um, they're really important in their job and they feel invincible. And then they come home and it's like, Hey, you got to take out the garbage. Yeah. And then you got to be like a dad and stuff. But I think what people don't realize is that doesn't just happen to professional wrestlers and rock stars. That happens to your everyday person that's just trying to get ahead, that's trying to work really hard. Because sometimes course. you just lose sight of what's going on. And it's, it, you have all these people that are working for you or with you. And um, and they're telling you how important you are. You've got social media is pulling on these strings as well. Yeah, uh, You create a product. People love the product. I love your product, man. You did a great job. You inspired me to start my own company or whatever. All these things, they... They're great. You know, they do help build you up, but it doesn't really have anything to do with um, uh, it building or expanding upon your relationship with your son, building, expanding 100%. upon the relationship with your wife, relationship with friends, other business. Rela- it doesn't really, doesn't really actually do much of anything. It, right. it makes you feel good. Um, but it's important to kind of understand, like, how do you cope? How do you deal with some of that medicine? You know, how do you deal with some of these things that happen? And uh, I see it eat people alive all the time. It ruins marriages. It ruins relationships all the time. And it's a, uh, it's not an easy thing to to tackle. And I think it's cool that that you decided, hey, like I, I want to figure out some of these things. I, I I'm dealing with a death, and this is a, a hard thing to deal with. And maybe you know going and and sitting on someone's couch and talking to a shrink. Maybe that's not your thing. But you found something else. Sure. I think that's great. I mean, thank you for that. I mean, the way I would justify it before. And again, listen, you know, it's not like I do something and it's fixed. I, you know, it, it's now about me recognizing mm-hmm. when I'm in a situation and I say something or I interrupt, I have to just recognize, you know what? And, you know, and, uh, and then we try to rectify it. But I would justify me working crazy hours and running around and snapping and emails and this. I would justify that, that I'm doing it for the family. So I would tell mm-hmm. my wife, listen, I'm doing all this stuff. Uh, you know, I'm on social media right now because I'm trying to build our dream and get us to where we want to go. So I would justify it that I'm doing it for you. So you should be grateful. Do you know what I mean? Whereas I, 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 I wasn't registering the fact that I'm taking away. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not adding anything, any value right now. I'm taking away, which is right. exhausting. I'm taking energy from the family and from the marriage. Right. So, you know, a, a buddy might said something interesting. He, he kind of put it in perspective. He's like, we, we wear multiple hats, right? You, you know, you have Mark at Slingshot, you've Mark in the gym, you've Mark at home, yep. you've Mark with the kids, you've Mark on his 10-minute walks, whatever it is, right? So we've all these hats. We have to pick and choose what hat goes on. Sometimes two hats go on at the same time, <laughs> right? Like, like here, you right. know, if you're in work and Andy's here, you have husband, but you also have boss. Um, we have to pick and choose. You can't wear all the hats all the time. It just doesn't work. Right. So when I'm with my son, I'm trying to be present and with him and put the phone down for five minutes. Nobody's calling me. That's important. Right. And I'm not important enough for anybody to call me that I, I need to hear from you right now. Do you know what I mean? And live in this moment right now. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, how to be present in. I'm talking to my wife. I'm, 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 I'm here right now. Right. Uh, you know, we're trying to find a house in Vegas. I'll, I'll deal with that after. So it's trying to understand when the hat goes on and what hat goes on. But more importantly, what hat comes off. So when you go home. I'm home now. I'm I'm with the kids. We're having dinner. We're watching TV. That's it. Work is done for now. 
you know, I can go back and do some later. But for a period of time, this is the hat I'm wearing and be present in that. Probably about four years ago or maybe even a little bit longer, uh, I stopped answering people and uh, stopped answering emails and stuff like that. And you know what happens? You stop getting emails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great. They just stop. And it, it, the, nothing has changed. Yeah. Uh, my, the, the uh, uh, success of this company hasn't gone down. Right. It, it's only gone up ever since we started it. And so I think, I think, yeah, we just get, we get really lost in it. And again, yeah, I, I really agree with your point. I think a lot of us just think, yeah, this is for you. This is for the family and this is yeah. for everyone else. And really, I guess it's kind of safe to say that if you're not really doing stuff with the family, then, then there's really no point in trying to argue why it's for the family. Correct. You know, like if we're not all together and we're not all doing something or, or we're not trying to plan something together, um, That's a good then, point. then, then it's just, uh, mo most of us, you know, a lot of us in this country, we're, we're not really dying for that next five bucks, right. you know, that next $2 right. or whatever it is. And so having said that, yeah, you, you doing an extra post or something is not make or breaking, <laughs> Uh, whether you're getting evicted from your home or whatever, sure. you know what I mean? Sure, It's like not that big of a deal. It, you know, really, you know, listen, in the grand scheme of things, we all have it pretty cushy over here, mm -hmm. you know, even if you don't think you do, because, uh, all, you know, we spend our time comparing ourselves to other people anyway, and everybody values success on the stuff we have. They see the car, well, that guy must be really successful. I wonder what he's doing. Um, you know, You know, I want that life, but they're not even focused slightly on their own because they're looking at the other stuff that the other guy has it doesn't mean anything just because he has a flashy car doesn't mean that he's successful he might be making money but his home life might be in the toilet do you know yeah. what i mean right for me i'm i'm trying to find the balance obviously i want the success you know i i i uh, you know i want to leave a legacy i want to show myself and my family that i came over here for a reason and not just to you know not just to hang out on the beach i you know i came over here so that i can leave a legacy and you know right you know, help propel them, you know what I mean, to, you know, to greater success. And obviously for my wife and my son. Um, but you have to, you know, you have to have something. You know, it's not about something. You have to have something inside you that drives right. you. And it's not a fucking car and it's not a watch. Who gives a shit about that stuff? That stuff's not going to do jack for you. Right. Health has, has got to be number one. And just happiness. I mean, you know, you know, money, obviously. But I mean, health and happiness, if you don't have those two, man, you got squat. Right. So it's taken me a while to figure some of this stuff out. But just to just to speak to the point of the course, the reason I did it is I felt I needed to do something to kind of unblock some of the noise in there and give me some sort of clarity. And, uh, you know, and obviously, listen, you know, if my wife said that she needs to be heard and I'm not hearing her, I better work on that quick smart or I'll find myself on my Jack Jones going back to Ireland. Do you know what I mean? Right. And that's not an option. So, you know, it's all about just, um, you know, being open to to talking about stuff and figuring things out. Yeah, they say the worst thing about communication is thinking that it ever happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I think is an amazing <laughs> quote because you're like, yeah, no, I no, Gavin, I told you. No, I told you before. Yeah. I told you before that I don't, I don't like doing that. And you're like, no, dude, like we haven't, we never discussed that yeah. before, you know? And so, I, you know, you get frustrated and you, you try to think about these different things that you may have said or may not have said. But bottom line is we don't really do a great job of communicating. No, I mean, I didn't think I was unique in my lack of communication skills by any stretch, <laughs> um, but it was important enough for me to try and do something about it. Right. And listen, it's not just, I mean, you know, trying to communicate with people is not just about my wife. I mean, it starts there. It's about us communicating right now, especially if you have a message you're trying to get across, if you're trying to speak about a business or a cause or, you know, something, something that you're passionate about. You have to be able to communicate that and articulate that. And I don't just mean in sort of, you know, in, in the verbal sense, I just mean being able to get your message out there and whatever means that happens to be. Um, but I mean, learning these things at any age is a, it's uncomfortable, right? Because you start to see your own inadequacies and start right. to see, you know, your own areas that you're falling short on. Um, but B, it's kind of exciting too, because you know that you're opening up new avenues that you obviously haven't been in before for me, for, you know, for sure. Um, so we just, you know, Listen, it's a roller coaster. We figure this shit out as we go. That's kind of where I'm at. How'd you get these uh, nut butters going? Let's talk about them. We got some Beardy Boy nut butters up here, and uh, you sent me some a while back, and I tried some when I was down in Los Angeles, and it's a freaking fantastic product. Thank you, man. It's great. So this all came about, I was working, um, and I still do a little bit of personal chefing, so I work for clients. So I was working for a couple of guys in um, LA, 
and they'd ask me for some snacks. So, sorry, you know, I was doing all of their food, all of their meals, it was all prepackaged. Meal prep, but a little higher level. Gotcha. Um, so it was more customized. Um, so I had uh, worked for them through a trainer from New York who had hired me to cook their food out here to keep them on track with their training and their diet. So uh, they very simply said, you know, we'd love some snacks, but don't eat almonds or peanuts. Mm. You know, some sort of a nut butter. I literally was in Whole Foods and I saw a bag of, a bag of pecans and I said, let me make it pecan butter. Because I've made almond butter before. I've made cashew butter right. just because I make them for myself at home. Uh, literally made that, um, made a couple of variations of it, had some maple syrup, put a little bit in and I had some Celtic sea salt, which I love. And that's what ended up being, being the smash. So I had that. I was giving it to them for, I don't know, six months, just mm. giving them big, huge jars. And every time I'd come back, the thing would be empty. Like, this is amazing. I was like, oh, cool. Uh, and then I had some of the pecan pieces in my house because I was just making it at home for them, just small batches. And I had friends come over and they'd pick at it and, oh my God, this is amazing stuff. What, you know, you know, what a great snack. So um, my business partner that I had, hence the name The Beardy Boys because we both had beards. doesn't make sense now because he's not a partner anymore. So we'll have to <laughs> change that, but that's a different conversation. Um, we, we had talked about doing a product, so he designed the outside. And I literally walked into Air One store in Venice and I had three flavors. And I found the manager, I walked up to him, I put three jars down, put three spoons, and I said, taste that. He had it. I, I'd already looked to see there was nothing else on the shelf. I said, let's go over and look at the shelf. This is how I handled the conversation. I'm not sure it's the way to go, but it's the way I did it. We looked at the shelf. I says, I'll take that shelf there. How many cases do you want? <laughs> and he said, I'll take six. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, now I got to figure out how to mass produce. Now I got to <laughs> find pecans because I, you know, I have to have to source them. So I sourced all the ingredients. Right now I buy the pecans from a farmer in Texas. I sourced the maple syrup to a family farm in um, Maine and I deal directly with them. So three ingredients. Listen, I wanted to create something that I would eat, something I would feed my son and my right. wife and my friends. I wasn't creating something for a, for a product purpose. I was creating something to eat that's clean, that's healthy, that's nutritious. Uh, and again, something for me was initially it. Um, and that's how that, and then I just made the other flavors. Um, and that's how we got the product. Yeah, something that just doesn't have a lot of junk in it. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I don't eat junk food. You right. know, so I mean, if I'm going to eat something, I want to make sure it's got the best ingredients that I can put in it. Um, uh, and again, you know, also my son is six, so I wasn't going to feed him something that has all these preservatives right. and additives. It's just not happening. So, um, so that's how we ended up and, on the shelf. And you've been passionate about, you know, keeping the meals uh, healthy for for a long time anyway, right? I mean... Well, I mean, the Cindy Crawford thing, even yeah. before her, I mean, I was into, do, you know, in, into cooking healthy food. I mean, I studied nutrition in Santa Monica College because I wanted to learn more about it myself. So, I mean, I've been into fitness and food for a long time. Um, never tied in what I do as a chef into the fitness world until I got really passionate about it myself. Uh and now it's just you know now this is you know that's my ni my niche if you will. I think everybody thinks that if it ta that it if it's uh, healthy that it can't taste good. Well, I mean, yeah, right. Well, you know, which is uh, you know a lot of people say that you know the healthy you know healthy food is boring and bland because it used to just be you know a little boiled or grilled chicken, <laughs> carrots and brown rice that doesn't even sound good, right? <laughs> but you can make that taste good if I had the same three ingredients. You can cook those with very little um, added fat. Mm -hmm. but just seasoning, you know, a little bit of uh, olive oil or something on there. And you can make those three bland ingredients taste really, really tasty. Right. So it's, you know, it's all in the perception. I think healthy food has gotten better. Um, but for me, you know, I've, I've, I've cooked this way for 15 years, you know, almost 20 years. Yeah. So I've kind of grown along with it. Um, maybe a little bit ahead of the curve. I don't know. But I mean, I've been involved in this, you know, area for a long time. Yeah, and you you've done some uh, even some meal prep type stuff that you've you mentioned. I I I've I've done some meal prep. I work with a lot of nutritionists and trainers. So, for instance, they might have um, you know, a a, a a football or basketball guy coming in to LA for the summer. Maybe mm -hmm. they're off season. So, if they're on a program, like I had one guy who was a footballer, and they they wanted to put weight on him during the summer. So he was working with the trainer and a nutritionist, and they hired me to cook the food, so I would do all his meals. So he had all bases covered because he needed to put on size in the, in the off-season. Mm. So, you know, eating healthy food and, you know, cooking the way I cook is not only to lose weight. You know, sometimes, you know, people want to put on weight, but they want to do right. it in a healthy way. So there's ways to do it, you know. You know, putting on weight is not just going to in and out. You know, you got to eat, you know, proper right. food, but just eat more of it or m m m maybe more dense food. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's... 
the 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 connotation of the boring and bland is still out there a lot. Yeah. Because you've a lot. You, listen, you've a lot of competition in meal prep companies. Oh yeah. And I don't consider myself a meal prepper as such. I mean, I work with clients who are very specific in their diets. They want the best mm. ingredients, and it's very customized. So it really depends on what they're looking for. But it's really more of a bespoke service, and I don't do as much of it anymore. It just depends if somebody comes in town. Right. Yeah. It's always nice to be called. <laughs> yeah. That, that's that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, I think you know the meal prep industry has kind of boomed you know you start to see all the there's so many companies now uh they've really uh kind of popped up all over the place how do you get um you know with your catering business and with your pecan butter um how are you making people aware of this um you know what are what are some things that you're working on or trying to do to to build your business or maybe you're not even trying to build the catering business uh for now maybe you're focused on this i'm not sure the catering business is not um is not my uh primary focus right now so what i'm doing is because i've i've had a vision let me tell you so i had a conversation um i was in caa the agency in uh, la about 10 years ago one of my clients i had done a little tv slot one of my clients got me into an agent just to more kind of get ideas of how i how how i would get my name and my, my brand out there and i walked into this room and there was two girls they were like 21 and 22 you know and they're having a meeting with me and they're like who the fuck is this guy <laughs> So they sat down and like, oh, yeah, you know, you've done this. That's great. That's great. You know, I did one show or something. So, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, and I looked them both straight in the eye and I says, I'm building a food and fitness empire. And they stared at me and they looked at each other and they stared at me. That's lovely. <laughs> As if I'm, you know, just some guy who just right. walked in, which I was, to be fair, just some guy who walked in. But I was very clear on what I was doing. And this was 10, 12 years ago. And that's still been my vision. It's still my vision. And that's what I'm doing. So I, so I always wanted to marry my two passions of being a chef and loving food, you know, healthy, clean food right. and doing something in the fitness world. Because as you know, you know, fitness and working out is, is my other passion. Yeah. And my family comes after that. Uh, <laughs> so, you, you know, this is not my first run, you know, the product you know, I, I had tried, you know, I tried the protein bars and all mm -hmm. these other sorts of snacky things, but this is the one that just came the easiest and just came really without any effort, which is always a good sign yeah. that it's received well, you know, when you don't have to put a lot of effort in. So my vision is to create a brand, my brand, but incorporate healthy, clean food products within it. Right. That could be for the fitness world, but also for people who just want healthy, clean food and, you know, tasting, you know, tasty, obviously. So that's, you know, so I'm just building that empire, you know, one thing at a time. I mean, I'm, so I'm building my brand, but right. my brand's going to be incorporated with this brand and vice versa. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's work. It's a lot of work, as you very well know. But when you just love something and you're so passionate about it, it's like, a, it's like you know, it just consumes you. Yeah. And you have a million ideas, a yep. uh, but you just got to mainstream them and you got to streamline everything and stay present in what I need to do today. Because you start thinking of everything I got to do tomorrow and the next day. And I need to have all these followers and I got to do this and I got to get in this store. And, you know, you'll drive yourself crazy and you, you, you'll end up getting nothing done. So the vision is to grow the Gavin Murphy brand. You know, we'll incorporate this, you know, somehow right. into it. But I have a list of all products that I can make using this product. And then I have other products that I want to come out with as well. So it's just a matter of streamlining. Yeah, you, uh, you cooked for Andy and I for uh, her... Uh her birthday mm -hmm. and uh i mean it was it was amazing thank you the food was the food was spectacular but then uh we also had some uh dessert we had some ice cream i think just vanilla ice cream with yeah. some of this with, with this on top with some of the beard yeah. boy stuff on top and it was ridiculous but actually chris you, you know your brother mm -hmm. made the keto ice cream oh that's right yeah that was killer too though yeah that was really yeah good. yeah but i mean uh you know, there's a lot of ways to go with this i mean i i actually sell this in a cheese store in beverly hills and they go through tons of it oh wow because they up because it goes really good with cheese and you know two you know in, in, you know two of the flavors in particular so i mean luckily this product is not just in you know the nut butter family where people mm -hmm. assume you know like peanut butter almond butter this can be you know it's diverse yeah, and again it, it wasn't flavor you know it has a different flavor profile but it's more diverse than just putting a scoop of almond butter on ice cream this one has the flavor and texture and i've made ice cream with this which is obviously a different flavor again so um yeah, you know, I just got to control all these <laughs> thoughts, which is going in 500 directions, but it's fun though. And you'll be able to do uh, the catering business from Vegas? 
I'm not sure I'm going to do that. I might do that. I mean, I'm going to go in there. I have a chef consultancy job, which I'm going to go in and do for a few months just to get my feet wet. But this is, the, you know, this is my baby. Okay. I mean, I'm seeing this is my transition time now. Right. So I worked on me. The family's transitioning. This is my time now to start getting this out. I'm just going to push full steam ahead. I mean, I still have to make a living, obviously. Right. Um, and obviously Vegas is a little cheaper to live than Los Angeles. Uh, but um, yeah. This is this is my time now to start getting everything. Moving. You know, the good thing about all this is that you know when you when you repair some of these some of these issues and and when you go back and take the time to try to figure out you know what's wrong or how am I dealing with the situation um, as you move forward, you don't have to take these a uh, big giant step backwards again. Right. You know now now it's. Um, you know, I don't, I don't exactly know all the different degrees of, of your situation, but when, when you let other people around you know what's going on and the people that are close to you, uh, it's no longer like you just trying to do this thing on your own. Yeah. Now you got the support of family and friends that you've communicated with about how you, you know, went back and took the time to kind of deal with some of these issues. Sure. And like you said, I really like that you said it's not fixed, you know, like, cause that's a, that's a shitty way that people look at stuff like, oh, I fixed this situation. Right. No, well, uh, you, you took care of it yeah. and, and you helped it along, but you, may, you probably didn't like fix it, fix right. it. You know, it's not going to just disappear. But you, you went back and you did what you're supposed to do and now you're able to, to cruise forward. Well, to be, uh, you know, to be totally honest with you, I've never, apart from that one time with those uh, agents, I've never said out loud that I'm building a food and fitness empire. And I think that might have been down to the fact not that it hasn't been there or gone away. It's always been there. I think it was more of saying it out loud than it's opening up conversations with other people. Then you're really putting yourself out there and that's uncomfortable to do. So if this had been maybe three weeks ago, prior to me doing a little bit of work, I probably wouldn't have said it. Mm. But I'm more comfortable now putting out my intention because that's what I'm doing. So as you rightly pointed out, the more people you talk to about it, the more conversations you can have and actually get something done about it as opposed to, you know, if it's in your head, well, nobody can get in there to help you with it because they don't know it's there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm having a vision is one thing, but you got to talk about it. You know what I mean? Not to every single Tom, Dick and Harry, but you talk <laughs> yeah. about it with the right people. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you plant a seed, you know, and when you plant, your, you plant a seed, uh, you don't just plant one, you plant many of them because sure. you don't know what's going to grow, what's not going to grow. But you also don't go digging the seed up every other week right. to see what happens. You believe in the growth process. You put something out there. You work hard. Um, maybe you start working on other things. Maybe yeah. you start working on like, quote unquote, harvesting other crops, right? right? You start messing with some other things. And then you look back and you're like, oh my God, there's that stuff starting to grow that yeah. I planted a while back. Sure. Okay, well, I guess it makes sense. It's getting the life that it needs. It's getting the air. It's getting the water. It's getting the sun. And, uh, and there it goes, but like how much, uh, it shows how little faith somebody may have if they continue to kind of dig up these goals and continue to try to, uh, dig up these seeds that they plant and you're better off kind of setting a goal. You set a goal and it's something that it will, it will, without you saying a ton about it often, like you said, you don't share it with everybody, but just with you putting it out in the universe a couple of times. You know, I know people talk a lot about these affirmations and some people think they're bullshit and some people are big believers in them, but sure. you put these things out there and like I said, you work your ass off that that's never, you're never going to be free of that. Right. You're always going to have to work, right? But what will happen is that dream that you had, that goal that you had to have, let's, let's just say you wanted to have a Ferrari, right? I put it out there. I say, you know what, I, that, that would be my dream car. I'd love to have a Ferrari. You and I talk about it. Three months from now, you and I are going to the gym. We're driving. We're, we're not even thinking about it. We stop at a red light. What pulls up next to us? A Ferrari, Ferrari right? right? Then you start to see it more and more. You're like, oh, there's another Ferrari. Oh, there's yeah. another one. Yeah. Oh, there's another one. And the goal starts getting a little closer. And that's when it's okay to start to really think about what, what this really going to look like because you've been working towards it all the correct. time. I think correct. Kind of the mistake sometimes people will make is they have a goal. They'll put something out there. And they're not really doing the work necessary to, to get there. And they keep looking up, you know, they keep looking up over and over again. Like, is it, is it, am I closer yet? Am I closer yet? And it's like, no, you're not, you're not, you're not any closer because you didn't work any harder. Right, you right. didn't, you didn't put in any more effort. Well, unfortunately some people, and I, I think people are more aware of it now. So they're more attuned to what's going on. But before, you know, when the secret came out, people would, you know, in it would be visualize what you want. And suddenly it just arrives like right, a right. genie. Mm -hmm. 
But what they didn't tell you is you still have to work your ass off <laughs> every single day. And you might have days where you look like you're just running into a wall. <laughs> yeah. But then something might click. You know, to speak to your point about the car, I, I, you know, I mean, I've, I've had those conversations and sometimes you see the car that you love and you'll see it, you, you know, you see 12 of them a day and like, how come I didn't notice them before? Because you weren't in tune with it. That's why you didn't see it. <laughs> right. You know, it's one thing talking about it, but you have to be in tune with what you're saying, which is super important. And some people, you know, they put something out there, you know, I want to have a product or I want to, whatever they want to be, but then they stop. Yeah, and then they get focused on this thing over here. They're not, you know, if 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 you have a goal, you have to strive towards your goal every single day. You got to make moves towards that destination. You can't say, "Listen, I want to go here, but I'm going to go this direction." It doesn't work that way, right? So you got to be focused on what you want. Keep working at it every single day. Um, not you have to be consumed by it, um, but you can't keep questioning it. Yeah, you know, my you know, my vision for this empire I've had in my head for fifteen years. And I see it in my head, the journey I don't see in my head, you know, sometimes like this, it takes shape as, okay, you know, I can see this. I mean, I'm here with you today. Okay. You know, I can see some, some sort of meandering towards where I'm getting to. Um, but you have to, and, and plus you have to applaud, you know, these little baby steps that you take. You say, okay, you know what? I worked towards this. So I got here and then you move on. But sometimes I think we're distracted by wanting so many different things that we're not focused on what we really want. Right. And plus, if it goes out of your head and you're like, what was that thing I wanted to really, oh yeah, I wanted it. Well, then it's not in there in the first place. Do you know what I mean? So you, know, you got to stay in the moment and really, really tune in on what you're looking to do and then just go. Super Training Gym is uh, about 12 years old. Um, my son is 14. Um, my daughter is 11. Um and uh, Slingshot is, uh, was 2010, so Slingshot is eight, is eight years old. Um, all this stuff that you've seen when you've come in today, this uh, big-ass warehouse that we're in, the podcast room, the shipping and receiving, the gym, everything you see, all these things have been built. This is like, the, this is like uh, Super Training 5.5 right? Uh, because we've been to many different uh, locations and we built up over the years. But my point is, is... All this has been built up from my uh, son probably being uh, about two, right, and then and not even having my daughter yet. So all this stuff has been built uh, through all that, and I think those are the those are the and, and also through uh, my powerlifting career where I right, broke uh, all time world records and different things. And I'm not saying any of that to to brag. I'm just saying that you can get multiple shit done. And I got lost along the way many times, uh, lost in my own shit, lost in my own powerlifting, lost in my own business, uh, multiple times, but I've always figured out a way to, and luckily probably my wife is the main reason, but I've always figured out a way to come back down to right. reality and back down to the stuff that really matters, which is your family, your friends, being good to people, sure. all the just basic stuff, you know, being a man of your word. I mean, just all these things we always, we always hear all the time, but, uh, you know, if I can build it up, then fuck, why can't, you know, you can build it up too. Of course. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? I mean, go goals and dreams that you have, I don't see why you can't. You know, sometimes when people see other people who are successful and I mean, actually successful, maybe they have a great marriage and they have a great business. You can go one or one of two ways with that. Some people will be inspired and motivated. You know what? This guy did it. He came from a similar background. Maybe he didn't help. Who cares? But he got it done and he worked and he loves his family and loves his kids and he's good to his wife and he works hard and he plays hard, all of that. The other side of that is people might take that as, well, he must have been lucky. Maybe he was a rich kid. Maybe <laughs> his dad gave him something. Right. You know, so you can have perspective on both of those two things. Um, and whichever avenue you decide to take or whichever perspective you decide is the right one, whether it's right or not, um, you know, that says a lot about you and about what you're looking to do. If you are not applauding somebody's success, right. then you're taking away your own chances of success. I mean, for me, That's I understand that. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> you know, I need to applaud you for creating this empire over here and be fired up by it and motivated by it. If I'm not applauding you or I'm jealous of what you've achieved, I'm taking away any chance I have of being successful because you can't give out positive energy and be negative. You just can't do it. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> right. You know, positive goes to positive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I put out good energy. Uh, then in theory, I should get good energy back. Right. So I applaud what you've done. And I'm talking to you right now. Um, but that just fires me on. 
You know, yeah. I, I, I don't see that. At, oh, fucking Mark Bell, he must have been lucky, man. His <laughs> wife did everything for him. He's just sitting here fucking lifting weights. But that's not the case, man. You're in here every day and you're creating and you're building your team to get your vision and create things that you want, but you're overseeing it all. Right. So you know what your vision is. Other people are just able to articulate that and to actually, you know, um, you know, make that happen for you, manufacture that, whatever. Um, but, you know, you got to, you have to put out that energy to people, otherwise you have no chance. At what point are you just spinning your wheels, though? Like, uh, let's just, in a bad scenario, we got 80-year-old Gavin, like, talking about, uh, <laughs> uh, I got these these nut Still butters. build this empire. Yep, this empire is ready to go. Like, you know, when when can you, like, really see, like, okay, something's got to change? You know, I, 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 I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. For me... That just isn't an option. Mm -hmm. My mind just doesn't go there at all. You know, I don't, you know, I see myself having my empire still at 80, but I don't see myself trying to find it. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe, maybe that's naive. I'm not sure. But I, but my mind does not go to the fact that, God, I hope I'm not doing this in 20 years and still, you know, talking to Mark, he's in a fucking wheelchair because he can't stand, <laughs> you know, because he's so old and, you know, and, and I fell on the floor cause, because my walker broke down. But um, I think it's the case of, people who are acting, right? Because LA is all about actors. Right. And they're still trying to be an actor and they're 16, they're still trying to be an actor. Uh, you know, and they might do a couple of things. But did they really give it everything though? Like, were they taking the acting classes? Were they doing the theater? Were they doing the stuff with the no money? Were mm -hmm. they really 100% committed to get into where they want to go? Almost nobody that we I'm know. I'm going to say no, <laughs> right? But I know for me, Mm -hmm. I'm 100% committed 100% of the time, right? My mind just doesn't go anywhere other than what my vision is. Uh, and I don't see my vision as being in 20 years time. I see my vision as being around the corner because I don't know how long the journey is. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's mindset is, it's so crucial that you just have to trust yourself. Right. Um, and listen, you know, someone can tell you, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm all in on this and I'm, you know, and I'm giving it everything I got. But, but you can know you know, you'll know by speaking to them for five minutes if they're really committed to what their vision is, whatever it is, whatever job it is, you know, if they want to have a, you know, a car dealership or whatever. So it's really just about a personal mindset. Um, and then you just every single day, 100% commitment, regardless. Yeah. And to, and trying to, I guess, determine what it is that you actually want to right. is important, you know, and that saying like, um, you know, that you want to build like a juggernaut of a business or any of these kind of things, they would all be like uh, very general you know, or I want to be successful. It's right. like, well, it's just still very general. And there's uh, just so many different versions of that. But normally what we're talking about is usually we're just talking about being happy. You know, we're sure. trying to, we're talking about like pleasure, I guess, in yeah. a lot of ways, uh, things that just, that just make you happy. And money is a weird thing because some people will say money doesn't bring you happiness. Um, but it certainly does bring convenience and it, al it, allow it allows a lot of freedom. Uh, there's nothing better. That's the word. There's nothing better than just having a lot of freedom. Yeah. Like I don't have to do that or I can hire someone to help with that. Like those things are, those kind of things are great. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a great feeling to have that. And, um, you know, maybe, uh, that in abundance, maybe that's not even healthy either. But, uh, I guess the point is, 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 uh, those of you that listen to this podcast or following along, and you have some goals and you got some dreams, you know, try to define what they really are and what does it really look like? Um, if you want to be built like Mike O'Hearn, um, it may pull away from your life way too much. Right. It might not be for you because Mike, I mean, Mike will tell you he's Mike O'Hearn 24 yeah. seven. He, he never shuts <laughs> off. He, he is a, he's a goddamn lifting and eating machine. Yeah. And you will not beat him on in any facet of it. You're not gonna you're not gonna eat more meals than him. You're not gonna eat more protein than him. And consistency for or, him. Or if he wants to eat less, you're not gonna eat less than him. Like right. he, he will he will <laughs> fuck you up in all aspects. Yeah. Uh, whether it's the lifting or whatever. But you know, the, I guess my point is is when you cut, try to model yourself after somebody, you know, pick somebody that's pick something that's reasonable. Like what what does it look like? And for you. Uh, starting off in this category, I mean, you have some uh, big companies to kind of aspire to, to sure. be. Some of these companies have sold for, you know, three, hundreds, three, hundreds yeah, yeah, 300, 200 million, something like that, right? Uh, what was the, uh, uh, Justin's, right? Justin's for like almost 300 million. Yeah, 300 million dollars, you for, know? For so, an almond butter. 
Right. And now, this is a good product. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. That's a lot it's of money. It's a great product. I'm sure there was a, a lot of hard work. I'm sure there was some fortune in there as Plus well. Plus, there was 12, 12, 15 years worth of work. It wasn't just like yeah. an overnight thing. Right. So, right. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you know, they worked for that money. Yeah. And they got a good, you know, and, and, and they got their payday. It's nice to know that it's not unheard of. It's nice to know that it's not impossible. Sure. Someone sure. else has kind of been there before. Someone's done something similar. And, uh, but so your objective here too is, um, to create other products that Correct. aren't just, uh, pecan butters, right? Sure. Just to speak to your point, um, br yeah, go for uh, it. briefly though, you know, you know, having, a, um, goals that are specific, they also have to be attainable though. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say that I want to be like this company but you're doing something completely different. You have to find something that's that's kind of, you know, I agree. you know, similar-ish. Obviously, I mean, you're trying to create something that's, you know, that's different enough for the consumer to purchase. But the goal you have, you know, you can't set it so big that you're really setting yourself up not to achieve it. It's got to be attainable. And um, so for someone like me, seeing other companies that have sold for, you know, for, you know, for colossal amounts of money, um, you know, is very inspiring to me because I know that the product I've created is a good starting point. You know, this by itself is good. Luckily, mm -hmm. people like it. But I've, I have, I have, I have ideas to create products with my product. I mean, I've created ice creams. I've done um, muffins and bars and snacks. Oh, you uh, told me about the muffins, smoothies. Mm -hmm. You know, I make these sweet potato muffins with what well, you can pick your poison. Damn. Um, you know, I'd have brought some up, but I would have probably eaten them on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with it. I, I keep that's not a problem. I don't. I don't see that. I don't. Well, see. you keep sending it to me. I keep eating it. You're like, did you share it with your team? I'm like, what? But to see on the <laughs> back, it fair. just says to grab a spoon. So yeah. I keep it very simple. The instructions. <laughs> I, you know, notice how I don't give you a recipe. Just <laughs> grab a spoon and eat it, and then buy more. Yeah, and tell more people. It's a very simple process. Just have at it, right? Yeah, and uh, and continue to <laughs> to keep uh, purchasing. Just keep purchasing in multiple amounts. Yeah. Something I learned that I'll share with you is. Um, you know, in, in trying to grow the company and trying to expand and then trying to figure out, like, how do I get into, which everyone's always trying to figure out, like, how do you get the pulse of, like, the general pop? You know, how do I get, well, it took me a long time to realize, like, that's not even what I'm after. Like, what what do I even, I don't even really care about the general population. Like, I don't really care to have, like, my stuff in, like, Walmart or, or anything like that because the people that shop at Walmart aren't super healthy anyway. So right. <laughs> I, they're not going to really care about wearing a slingshot or something like that. So as I started to think about these things and, and think about it more over the years, I started to kind of realize I don't really want everybody as a customer. You know, um, it's a little bit like super training. Super training is, is, is a private gym, but it is free. And we do invite a lot of people in, but we don't want everybody to right. have the experience of super training. It's kind of sacred, you know? Now, I don't want to be that standoffish with the products because, you know, you do want to make a profit and everything, but I only am interested in having people that believe in what we believe in. Correct. And that's, that's where I'll leave, I'll kind of just leave it there. You know, like I don't, if somebody picks up your thing and you have a particular product and, and use a particular ingredient and, uh, you know, they don't, they don't like that ingredient or whatever. Well, that's not your person. Yeah. But that's okay too, though. Yeah, it's fine. And it's okay to not be liked by people. And for people not to like what you're selling them, you right. know, I mean, I've done plenty of demonstrations in stores, you know, you know, tastings and some people have come up and they said, oh, you use maple syrup. Um, you know, I don't like maple syrup or I don't eat sugar. Right. So it's great. Well, thanks very much. Uh, you know, I'm a, you know, hope you have a nice day. But, you know, you, you know, you don't take it personally. You know, if if they don't like it for any particular reason, even if they tasted it and didn't like it, that's OK, too. Because I'm I'm not creating someone for every single yeah. person to like. It's like, you know, it's like me. Not everybody's going to like me, but that's okay too. Do you know what I mean? Most Obvi people don't like. A lot of people don't. <laughs> like. Nobody likes me. Is what I'm saying to you. <laughs> I but, think you know if you were to get derailed and you were like, oh man, okay, that's the third person that said they don't like maple syrup today. And then now you're spending all this time trying to make a pecan butter that doesn't have maple syrup. Well, now you're getting away from no, no, no. what you believe. Absolutely. And uh, that, you know, once I landed on my, on, on my signature product, I knew that's what the formula was uh, because there's so little sugar in it anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not a big thing. And yeah, maple how many grams of sugar in syrup? It's like four. Yeah. So there's nothing. And there's five and the other two. So I mean, you know, it's a minuscule right. amount of sugar and it's maple syrup, which right. comes from a tree. Right. Right. So, um, you know, some people like honey, some people like to use stay in, you know, stevia, some people like to use xylitol, whatever. I just wanted to go with something that was as clean as possible. Right. You know, I wasn't making a product for the keto market necessarily or for, you know, for, you know, for any specific diet type mm -hmm. market. Um, 
So I was making a clean, healthy product. So this is what I wanted to put in it. But again, I made it for me. So to speak to your point, if I decided, well, maybe maple syrup's not the way to go. Maybe I should use, you know, erythritol or, or, or a xylitol. Mm-hmm. That's not what that product is. It then then I've just made a whole different product. kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like you're digging up your goals too early. You know, you're, you're digging you're digging them up and you're yeah. messing with them. Let them grow. And let Plant it sit. Plant the seed. Let, let that it thing sit, sit there. It, you know what? If it's good enough and it has longevity and people, you know, start to talk about it and like it, then it'll take off by itself. But you got to put in, you know, you got to water it, as you said, and you got to, mm-hmm. you know, you got to nurture it and make sure it's getting plenty of sunlight and food and then just let it blossom and see what happens. Where do people normally purchase your products from? Is it, is it all online or do you, are you in primarily, stores? Primarily online. We're in stores in Los Angeles because I can manage that market. Uh, but, you know, we're still a very new product. You know, we've only been out for like 18 months. So we're still new. So um, the website is Beardy Boys or Beardy Boys Inc. I have both of them. So we do most of our sales online. We, have, we, sh- we ship a lot to the East Coast, which is quite nice. This was a little video we made, a little trailer. Does video. everybody get that poster uh, of you lathered up <laughs> in the pecan butter, or is that just for me? <laughs> that was just for Andy, actually. But, oh, oh. Uh, uh, yikes! Sorry about that. Yeah, but yeah. I had the jar on, so I was good. Right? The jar I covered was... everything. Actually, the jar covered everything, which doesn't say much. <laughs> I was going to say I was impressed. It was very cold that day. I'm just putting that. There. Yeah, <laughs> look at this. You got a commercial. We, yeah, we made a little commercial. Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that it's was important it. to have fun with it, right? Listen, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's food. It's, you know, yeah, I, I tell people, some you know, people ask me what I do for a living. And if I don't feel like saying I cook, I say I'm a facilitator of happiness through food. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And that's pretty much it. You know, food's supposed to make you happy. It's yeah. supposed to make you, you know, nostalgic, thinking of, you know, how you grew up or Thanksgiving or whatever, you know, you, you know family holidays, birthdays. And that's what I try to do. I'm just trying to make something I, that makes people feel happy. I hear the ice cream truck coming down my street. It still makes me happy. <laughs> and I, I, I well, think maybe I've, you should put some of this in the ice I cream truck. I think I've had ice cream from an ice cream <laughs> truck probably once in the last 20 years. But every time I hear the noise, I'm like, oh, the ice yeah. cream truck. And I don't even, <laughs> I don't even go out. There. What makes it hard is I have to tell Jasmine, like, no, you can't have that. But I genuinely do wish, like, oh, man, I have a couple bucks. Let's go check it out. Well, you can run around <laughs> the corner and then just get an ice cream over there for you and just tell her she can't have it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, this question is kind of for both of you because this pecan smash is insane. It's really good. Thank you. It's only a matter of time before every company is going to make their own version of it. Yeah. And we see that shit all the time with slingshots and hip circles and stuff. What are your guys' thoughts? Um, like basically how do you, how do you combat like, um, like people just biting your stuff? Well, I've already had, I, I sell in a store in Los Angeles, um, and I have my cinnamon flavor, the, the, the pecan spice Mm -hmm. and they're an East coast company, you know, they add, They've been out for quite a while, so they're you know they are bigger than me, but they're not you know massive yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and my product, they have a product in the store. It's it's a specialty store. And one week I was in there looking, and I just saw their pecan cinnamon blend, <laughs> which had peanuts and something else in it. It wasn't just, but you know it it came out pretty quick. Right. Listen, there's very little you can do about it. Um, it's a, you know, on, on one aspect, it's a sign that you've hit something that's popular. So that's good. The flip side of that is you don't want to miss the boat. Uh, but listen, there's enough market out there. There's enough people out there. There's enough consumers out there where everybody can do well. So I don't, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not pissed because they, you know, you know, came out with a flavor that's, you know, that's very similar to mine, but it is what it is. I mean, you just take it and you just, you know, you know, I'm 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 moving my train forward every day, so maybe it's maybe someone else's train is going faster. I mean, I could compare myself to other companies that I know are startups, who've been out the same length of time as me, but they might be in Target or Whole Foods already, and I could question myself. Well, shit, how come I'm not in Target or Whole Foods? I've got a good product. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, in, in, you know, uh, the uh, the the situation is 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 the way it is. I mean, would I like to expand faster? Of course, I would. Um, You're probably not ready for it either. You well, there is that. I mean, you got to be ready yeah. for this. I mean, I could have could ruin your company completely. Well, yeah, I, you know, I went into Whole Foods in uh, the head office in Glendale in LA, and I had a meeting with them, and they liked the product. Um, so I could easily go to Whole Foods and have them put me into a store. 
but am I ready to produce that much product? And what if I say I can deliver by this and I don't? Or have I thought about how I'm going to get the product from my kitchen to their... Oh, they ask you a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know... Um, you're like, what size pallet do you ship in? And how, how is it boxed? And you're like, uh, uh, I don't ship it by a pallet. It's usually <laughs> just three or four in a box. <laughs> yeah. so what, what delivery service are you going to use? I'm going to drop it off later today if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. But I'm okay with it because this is my journey. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. very easy to get caught up in the whole thing. But, you know, the Whole Foods thing, you know, I wasn't ready for them. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I'm not sure Whole Foods is the avenue for me anyway. Never really was kind of jumping over hoops. To be like everybody says you and Whole Foods. I'm like, I'm not really sure Whole Foods is, is, mm -hmm. is like where I want to put yeah. it. And they're like, the people, they're the people that have suggestions are, are, you know, they're just, they all mean well. They're just trying to, they're just trying to throw something your way that, that sure. they think that you didn't think of, which is kind of funny because when you think about how much you think about this stuff, you know, it's like, it, it makes you want to punch people in the face, even though they mean well. You're Whole just... Foods. Of course I've thought of Whole Foods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You fucking What asshole. am I stupid? Yeah. Now, where is it? You know, and, uh, yeah, they just don't realize like how much thought you put into it. But in terms of like people, you know, copying you or whatever, uh, you know, there's, there's always going to be people that do that. And again, you know, you, you want people that are on board with the message. Uh, the same thing happened to the company Justin's, uh, there was other companies making, sure. uh, terrible, uh, not a terrible sounds funny, <laughs> uh, tear open, um, uh, packets of, of, uh, honey and, and nut butters and different things like that. Uh, as soon as they started doing that and you know maybe they copied somebody else but they ultimately uh kind of had the ma message that lasted the longest and that was the strongest and they were able to hang in there listen you know like 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 you know like anything we do family marriage all of it have to have the foundation you have to know what you believe in like i know why i created this product i know what <laughs> this product is i know the ins and outs of this product so i know what my message is in creating a quality, I consider it a premium product, not necessarily in price point, but in the terms of the ingredients and the love I put in and the sourcing the ingredients and right. the glass, you know, the fact it's in glass, all of that speaks to what the product is. That's my message and I'm sticking to it. You know, I've had people come to me and say, listen, you should put it in a, you know, 12 or 16 ounce plastic plastic container. You can sell It'd more. Be way it's cheaper. Way cheaper. You can get it to more people. It's a big, huge bucket of butter. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not selling a fucking bucket of butter. That's not what I'm doing. It's, a, it's just a different product. Mm -hmm. Now, do I want everybody to get it? Of course I do. But I want to control it as much as I can to get people to understand what my connection to creating. When I do demonstrations in stores and I tell people that I made the product, this is my product, first they're stunned that I'm there doing it myself. But mm -hmm. I'm like, and they say, so, you know, how did you come up with it? And I tell them the story. I was making it for somebody else. I had a thing, you know, I made it. And they're like, my God, I'm so happy that I met you and, you know, and that I can hear about how it started because now I understand the product. Now I feel the passion you put into making it. Right. As opposed to someone who just says, oh, I think I want to make a product. What am I going to make? Maybe I'll just make a t-shirt. But there's no <laughs> connection to the fucking t-shirt. It's just a t-shirt with something written on it. Do you know right. what I mean? But, but your slingshot was for you because you understood and you created it for you for a purpose. Right. Other people are taking advantage of it and they're utilizing it. Same thing. You have to have, have some sort of connection to what you're doing. Yeah, I, I've just never really been all that worried about it. Actually, I most of the time I've just thought it was uh, kind of funny. I'm like, shit, someone in Russia, like, great, mm. you know, made the product. And I guess the one thing that would piss me off is just that if people were getting confused about, you know, what company it, the what company it was, like that would be the only thing. Um, but that usually doesn't happen, but it can be something that happens because like on Amazon, if you go to search for something, um, uh, it wouldn't happen with us because all of our products are there. But if for some reason somebody uh, beat you to the top and, and uh, you type in slingshot and someone for whatever reason had a better search thing set up uh, and they clicked on a product that was a knockoff, that would kind of suck. Right. That'd be just about the only thing. Like if there's any confusion about like the branding, uh, that'd be the only frustrating thing. But other than that, yeah, just people are going to. Have 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 you had any trademark issues in in people like doing a yeah yeah we yeah we've yeah we've uh, yeah we've you know had to send out letters and things like that right. to, to different people and um you know it's everyone's always like ah oh, you should sue this guy or do this you, you first of all you kind of can't always just do that uh, it's not always as easy as it sounds and who the hell wants to even do that right you know some of these people I actually know too so it's like. 
you know, I don't, I don't want to go around soon a bunch of, bunch of people. I, I mean, what kind of life is, that? <laughs> you know, I'd rather just concentrate on executing what we do well. And, uh, we have lawyers and attorneys and people that are, you know, well equipped to figure out some of those things. Um, and I'd rather just not even really worry about sure, it, you know, sure. like if, if they're not, I mean, there's all kinds of different things that go into somebody taking, you know, I, I have three United States patents, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into, uh, somebody infringing on your patent. It's right. not just that they copy the design and sell it. Uh, you have to have proof of how much they're like cutting into your business and all these other things. It gets to be very complicated. And then you'd have to go, you may have to you may have to go get representation in the state that they're in and it's like a giant it's a, it's a giant pain in the butt money fest right yeah <laughs> uh earlier you were talking about um once mark left la uh recently <laughs> what training was like after training with him for a month straight <laughs> you mean when we collapsed yeah, yeah yeah i mean just for people who do you know don't know mark you know was in la for was it july or august july july yeah july for the whole month so uh, he yeah, trained last. <laughs> yeah, he trained with uh, Mike, myself, and whoever else decided to come in at four AM. <laughs> obviously, including yourself and the guys. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we went through a pretty, in, you know, intensive four week training because you know you had your competition coming up. So although you're training for a bodybuilding competition, we were still going after it every day. There was yeah. no pussing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pussyfooting around. Uh, we were going at it hard. So then the week after Mark had left, me and Mike were in training one morning. And we were doing like arms or shoulders, and we both like, just looked at each other and we're like, "I am so busted right now. My <laughs> body is just destroyed." And I think we took like three days off that week, which is unheard of, because we were just body was just shocked to shit. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I spent a week eating, which actually <laughs> felt good. But uh, yeah, I mean that was intense. That was a lot of fun. No, it was a great. lot of fun. That was great getting that training done. And yeah, and, uh, yeah, the workouts were the workouts were hard, and you did have to come ready ready for battle you know um I, I remember there was like one or two days that mike showed up just a little bit late just a little bit after four and i made fun of him and then it never happened again yeah but it's a very intense environment even though none of us are trying to be intense no one's like trying to be an asshole or anything like that it's just um you're expected to like be prepared and like on a squat day like we're just going to keep loading up weights and if you can't hang then and don't then yeah then we'll see let's, yeah let's see yeah you know. right and uh <laughs> it's and the first thing michael asks is like hey what'd you eat and you're like well it's four in the morning what, i mean i didn't eat anything you know he's like he's like no it doesn't work that way you need to eat yeah you know no, so you gotta wake up at three or 245 yeah. or whatever it is i'm you know i mean you got to come in and be expecting to be training you know as we talked about earlier when you come in at that hour in the morning you know you're coming in you know uh, you know to lift <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean you're coming in to go after it not, yeah. not coming in to walk around and watch the news at 5 a.m then just stay at home in bed do you know what I mean? Now, you know, is it intense every single day? Some days are not as intense, but we're still going after it for two hours. It's still, you know, you'll still feel it the next day. There's no doubt about that. But particularly on a leg day or a back day, which are the two big boys, you know, you better come in and be ready to go after it. And then, you know, you know, it might start off kind of calm, but then something's going to click somewhere in the, you know, in the morning and a little competition is going to kick in. And then it's not about sets and reps. Then it's just about, well, now we're just lifting weights. So now it's on. But that's part of the, you know, the pleasure. That's part of the, yeah. you know, the, you know, the sadistic pleasure of it. <laughs> One of the things I really liked is how much we switched things up. Um, we like very rarely did the same thing, same thing twice the entire time I was there. Right. Um, we may have done like incline bench more than once, but uh, the rep ranges were different each time. Sure. We may have squatted more than once, but the rep ranges or style of squat was different each time. One thing that I thought was actually really cool was um, we... Did box squats one week, and uh, we were doing those slow tempo box squats, and and uh, Mike ended up going pretty heavy on that day. He did about five plates right. onto a fairly low box. He maybe did like two or three reps or something like that. And um, the next week, I had a friend of mine come in who's uh, one of the media guys here at Super Training, Ryan Soper. Mm -hmm. And when Ryan came in, I was like, oh, this will be great because Ryan is a really good squatter. And I was like, Ryan will actually, at this at Mike's current strength level right now, I was like, Mike or uh, Ryan will be able to beat Mike or at least be really close to kind of push Mike to lift a little bit more. Wow. Mike walked into the gym that day mm -hmm. and he looked at me and he looked at Ryan and he goes, hey, how about we do leg press today? <laughs> <laughs> and me and Ryan were standing by the squat rack. I was like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I just... He, he, Mike knows the game, you know, and he knows how, he knows how to figure out 
a way to win. I think he just, he sized Ryan up. He was like, that's a pretty big dude. Probably one of Mark's friends. They're near the squat rack. I don't want to mess with that <laughs> yeah. battle for today. Yeah. Hey, let's leg press. Yeah, but he's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's pretty savvy in knowing um, which exercises to do. And if he's not feeling something, uh, then we'll just do something else. I like don't think people understand this. how damn big he is. He's a big boy. He's huge. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were, when we were lifting, um, I was like, man, I think maybe, maybe towards the end of the month, I'll be able to like catch him on something like somewhere. Like I'm just trying to hope and pray that like there'll be some exercise I'll be able I've to. I've never, I've, I've, I've only seen him beaten maybe once or yeah. twice in something. <laughs> yeah. Lance, uh, Lance Keys is pretty strong. There's a couple guys that are pretty strong that pop in here and there. You know, you got Kelly who works out with us, who's a cop, who's a big boy. Yeah. He's like 350 or whatever, you know, so he'll give him a run on shoulders or something. Mm-hmm. Just because he has him like a hundred pounds on him, yeah, or eighty pounds. But um, like here, he's doing bench press on one thirty-five, and he's at ninety-six reps. Yeah, some of the, I mean, it's crazy stuff because Mike doesn't train for that. So, you know, somebody who's watching it might be like, "Oh, he's a bodybuilder. He does high reps." Wow, one hundred and two. He doesn't even really do high reps that much. I mean, very. Uh, sometimes we do twenties. Yeah, but um, or a drop set. Yeah, but it's usually on a big day. You know, we'll do squats and then we'll do, yeah, let's do sets of 30. Mm-hmm. But 30 invariably gets 40 and 50s. Yeah. Because then I'll see, you know, Heath do something. And I know I can, you know, I can play a little bit on legs. Mm-hmm. So I'll jump in and maybe do five more. Then Michael come in and do 20 more. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, that was a total waste of time. <laughs> but yeah. it's amazing, like, the, uh, the <clears throat> conditioning that you get from these style of workouts. And, and anybody that hasn't really tried... Um, you know, the, a, bo- a bodybuilding style workout. The only reason why I'm referring to it as a bodybuilding style workout is just the pumps that we ended up getting sure. during a lot of these, uh, a lot of these movements. And I'll equate it to what we did yesterday. Andrew and I were doing some, uh, doing some arms and we started out with, uh, some reverse grip bench press and, um, you know, it's a challenging exercise. I haven't done them that much before. It's a weird movement. And so Andrew and I go back and forth on that. And then we move to like a close grip bench where we're trying to intentionally kind of keep the elbows out to really work the triceps, trying to keep the weight high up uh, so that we're, we're in the triceps and stuff as well. And um, I, I went up in weight. I don't remember what weight I had on there, but my elbow was, was kind of creaking around. I was like, oh, I'll just do another set. And I was like, that's just stupid. Yeah. Like, what am I doing? Like, right. I should think about some of the stuff that I did with Mike and how some of that stuff worked out really well. I should go down in weight. And Mike, instead of thinking about the muscle, is thinking about like the connective fibers. Longevity. Why he's doing a lift. And he's thinking yep. about longevity. Yep. So I went back down in weight. The weight felt awesome. I got this crazy burn but slash pump in the elbow rather than elbow pain. Right. And I was like, shit, now I just, you know, flooded the area with blood. Now it feels like a restorative rather than uh, I'm going to be hurt for, for two weeks, you know? He has a great way. And again, it's through his consistency over the, over, you know, the, you know, 30 years he's been in the game. Of if you have something that's hurting, he'll say, well, maybe just do this. Mm-hmm. Maybe turn this way, lift this up. Uh, it's like know. a savant in a way when it, comes to tr- when it comes to training, you know? I look sexy there, don't I? <laughs> do you? <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was, how how far out were you here? Um, probably. A few weeks. Yeah, uh, probably about. Like three uh, weeks? Yeah, about three weeks or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it was awesome training for that show. It was a lot of fun. Are you gonna do another one? No, it was a lot of fun once. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I, uh, I did I did enjoy the the training for it. I enjoyed some of the diet part of it, but I didn't really like the actual competition that much. Right. Uh, it was fun, but uh, you know, I, I I'm not gonna say I'll never do one again. But if I do one again, it probably wouldn't be for a while. These are very short reps by Stan. I mean, mm-hmm. he's going super fast. Right? <laughs> And he's vertical, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else over there, Andrew? No, that's all I got, man. Uh, yeah, everyone in the uh, chat, chat room is loving you, though. They're really inspired right now. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's fun. It was it's awesome. Fun. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else going on? Any, anything? Uh, when are you moving? Moving on uh, seven days. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. No, no. It's, I mean, I'm moving out of my house. Wow. Mover's coming on Sunday. What's O'Hearn going to do? Has he been crying? He, he, you know, he did cry a little bit, hmm. but I heard from somebody else because, you know, he just texts me, you're dead to me. So that really <laughs> means he's going to miss me a huge amount, <laughs> right? No, no, we're going to go for a pound of bison probably on Friday. That's our celebratory thing. And then he's going to move to Vegas because, 
he's screwed. <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> yeah. You know, we got uh, our buddy Stan Efferding lives out in mm. Vegas. There's a lot of people in mm-hmm. Vegas, man. I'm excited to go there because. But uh, he's not going to train at four in the morning. Stan, mm-hmm. Stan needs to sleep. Well, there isn't too many people at four in the morning, so I'm 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 going to have to start my own gym. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll start a little franchise of this gym and yeah. like my house in Vegas. That would be great. <laughs> I'll just sell stuff in the front, and then we'll put like a bench press or something. We'll start small. <laughs> got pecan butter and slingshots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can, actually, we could do a smoothie bar, mm. the keto oh, protein no. powder with some. No, oh, mm, I'm just saying. Shit. I'm just throwing ideas out there. Yeah. Mm. So, where can people find the uh, pecan butters? Pecan butter on my side, Beardy Boys Inc. Inc. dot com. We're uh, we ship all over the country. We have uh, yeah, you can buy as many or as many as you like, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, make great gifts. And uh, please try. Thanks very much. Uh, what's your Instagram? My Instagram is Gavin Murphy G A V A N M U R P H Y. And then you have one for Beardy Boy as well. Beardy Boys Inc. Same there as the website Beardy Boys Inc. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. See y'all later.